Hey everyone, welcome to Bedford Talks. This is the fourth episode, and I'm glad to have our next guest, which is Charles Peake. Man, I'm excited to be here with you, Tyler, today and talk about a little of what I do at the Weather Channel. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us and, and, uh, and just spending a little bit of time out of your day here. Uh, tell us a little bit about the type of work you shoot. Well, mainly uh, with the Weather Channel, most of what I'm doing is weather related. So it's going to be uh, storms. I'm, uh, my title is Storm Tracker Weather Reporter. Uh, so it's going to be tornadoes, hurricanes, winter storms, flooding, hail, and anything in between that can be weather related. Um, uh, around that, um, one of the things that we're just about to, to roll out in a couple of weeks is a, a new series on our TV streaming app uh, that is called Peak Travels. So I'll do around 75,000 miles a year driving around this country. And one of the things I see a lot of is destruction. But also I see a lot of beauty, a lot of interesting things. And so this whole series is going to be around that aspect of trying to capture some of the beauty uh, and some of the pretty things. I do hot air balloon uh, fiestas, uh, go to Albuquerque, do that fall colors, uh, uh, frozen waterfalls, uh, uh, you know, just interesting things. And so uh, around the weather part of it, uh, we're going to be showcasing some of the beauty of the country as well. And about how long have you been doing this type of work? Started uh, with this about 10 years ago. Started in a freelance position and uh, just did it on my own. Uh, Photography is really what drew me into it. I, I, I've, I started, as I was just saying, with the Pentax K1000 in the 80s, you know, uh, uh, shooting film. And I've always loved photography. Uh, but in the Weather Channel aspect, uh, I live in a video world. And so now probably 90% of what I do is video based and uh, we'll do, occasionally we'll use a picture that I shoot on air, uh, but for the most part it's all video and uh, you know, but uh, it's evolved. I've been now uh, going in my sixth year full time with the Weather Channel and uh, you know, it's even with that has evolved in some of what I do and, and, and more than just getting video of storms, but also uh, storytelling. And, and getting interviews with people and helping them tell their stories and, and those types of things as well. And equipment wise, what are you normally running with? Well, in my case, I could carry multiple cameras. I've got a Sony um, Z90 uh, on my dash that's mounted on the dash. It has a SDI out that goes into a broadcast unit that's in there. That's a, it's a bonded technology, has uh, seven modem inputs to it that then transmits direct, directly back to Atlanta and the TWC studios. Um, then also with me, I'll carry a, a transition the last couple of years to Sony primarily. Um, the Sony A7S III is, is, is my workhorse now. Uh, one of the things with that camera that has just been game changer for me is the low light abilities with that. Um, in many cases, uh, in the aftermath of a storm, uh, it'll end up being at night. Uh, a lot of our tornadoes happen late in the evening and so it can be after dark uh, and with that also you'll a lot of times have power outages so you don't even have street lights to help you. Uh, with my vehicle I've got some lights on it that I can do that but you, sometimes you can't get the vehicle to where you need to be. When you've got trees down and power lines down you're having to walk back into where you need to go. And so literally a, a light on top of this Sony A7, I've got a cage for it and put a light on top of that and I can crank up that ISO and then sometimes even brighten it a little more in post. But literally I can go into an extremely dark situation and have a very usable bright image that we can show on air to show what the situation is or an interview with a person whatever the case may be, and, uh, and that's just really been a game changer. I also carry the Sony A1, um, and, and so my primary setup on my A7S III will be a 24 to 70 lens, a 2.8, and it gives me that flexibility of, of being able to, everything I do pretty much is with a zoom, because you don't know exactly how far you're gonna be from whatever. Uh, on my A1, I'll put a 70 to 200 on it. And that's, you know, so I can jump out, grab something, and uh, in, a, in a perfect situation that never happens, but, you know, is I can then hit the video button, get some good clean video of it, snap a few pictures of it as well, 
the pictures honestly are more for myself. You sure. know, I do have a website, charlespeakphotography.com, that some people will buy some of my photography from, but you know, like I said, most everything is video based that I do. Um, and then I've got a big Panasonic camera that you know I can carry on my shoulder and, and do that. A lot of times if in inclement weather, I've got a big rain jacket on it and I can use it. And then I use uh, DJI drones. Uh, I've got the Mavic 3 Cine, I've got the Mavic 2 Pro, a Mavic 2 Zoom, depending on all those. I have a smart controller that allows HDMI out into that same broadcast oh, unit good. that I can do from the, the, the camera. So if all of a sudden you know we've got destruction or something, I can switch over. And the, uh, the advantage I can sometimes do is through you know a second phone that I carry. Mm -hmm. uh, I can literally be flying the drone it's going live into the weather channel and then I'm on the phone with them talking about what we're showing. So, uh, okay. so I can give that aerial perspective of tornado damage, hurricane damage, flooding, whatever the case may be, and can actually literally be live on TV at the same point in time all by myself. Wow. So, it, That's it, really, it's impressive what you can do with the technology you have on hand. Obviously, 20 years ago, this would have required a, a much uh, much heavier equipment, a lot more of the equipment, a lot bulkier equipment. Uh, but what you're able to do, plus the redundancies that you have, uh, just in terms of on the optical side, is really impressive. Well, it gives you that different perspectives. Um, you know, I may have a dash camera, I may have a regular B-roll camera, uh, I may have audio going. I even now have added a 360 uh, GoPro to the top of the vehicle. I did have a situation a couple weeks ago I had a tornado, it was only there for about uh, 30 seconds. And, uh, but the road I was on was a two lane road, you couldn't turn sideways. And by the time I could get to a turn off to face the camera to be able to get that, it had dissipated right at that point in time. But that GoPro 360 on top was able to capture it. And I was able to you know, go in, we still live in a, a 1080 world, mm -hmm. so oh, yeah. but I can go reframe that to that 1080 perspective because it got everything and be able to, to have usable footage to show that tornado as well. That's really, that's really interesting. Oh, and, and the technology keeps getting better and better. Uh, and, and it allows you to do, uh, it allows you to do more things that you weren't able to do in the past. Uh, even, uh, you know, if, if you were to tell me, you know, 15 years ago that we're shooting 4K and I can easily turn that into a vertical video. I mean, I, I never thought we would get back to vertical video or really even have the prevalence of vertical video in our society now uh, with you know certain uh, uh, social media platforms. It's really pretty fascinating. It really is, Tyler. One of the challenges that I run into, and I don't know how many of our viewers uh, fall more in my age group range, uh, but uh, I turned 60 this past year. So um, some of this technology is a little bit of a challenge for me. As you know, occasionally I'm calling you going, hey, Tyler, how do I do this again, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so it is somewhat a challenge. The vertical, I'm used to everything is landscape. That's the, the aspect dimensions of a TV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, we tease, and, and, and as a side note, if you're ever gonna get any video of a storm or anything, turn that camera sideways, you know, that's what we need for TV. But, you know, and then all of a sudden now, our social media team's doing stuff on TikTok. And so sometimes they're wanting me to get a vertical video. And so I'm trying to think that way, uh, uh, you know, but uh, as I told one of our producers the other day, I said, listen, I know I'm an old dog, but I can learn new tricks. Just, you gotta be patient with me <laughs> and stuff, so. But it is sort of interesting. It's just, things are happening so fast. The technology is changing so fast and it's improving so much that, uh, you know, it, it, constantly you're sitting there thinking, going, okay, how can I implement that into what I'm doing? Um, I literally was talking to a producer back in Atlanta yesterday because I've got all this 360 around the storms and you can see it behind you. And, but it's like, okay, how can we pull that together? How can right. we use it? You know, uh, on some of the social media, you can use a 360 where somebody can do it. You know, do we want to format it in that format or do we want to reframe it and you even have the ability where it'll stay on the storm as you're moving? Mm -hmm. So there's some just some neat creative things that you can, you know, do with them. And, and it's sort of fun to have that creative juices, you know, going out there to go, okay, what can we do with this? Mm -hmm. and so, 
Now, this is a question I've, I've asked all of our participants. Uh, what is a focal length that you tend to gravitate toward? Now, whether that's a specific focal length or you tend to shoot on the wide side or the tight side? And, and, and the easy answer for that, Tyler, is yes. Um, I do all of it. And, uh, you know, when it's the storm side of things, I'm going to gravitate in many cases a little more to the wide side. Um, on my a7S III, the primary lens I leave on that is a 24 to 70, and it gives me those options. Um, you know, for an example, I was on a couple of tornadoes this past uh, week, last Friday, and, and sometimes, okay, you want to see the whole storm. You know, you want to see those clouds wrapping, here's the tornado coming down, but then to show the violence of it, sometimes to zoom in at the bottom where you can see it picking up the dust and the debris, and so that gives me the ability, even in video, to do both and to also capture images, pictures, if I want to with that. Um, the 24 to 70, same thing. It gives me options that uh, uh, there and, and, and also the 70 to 200 in a different way. Um, when it gets to people, um, you know, one of the things for me is I'm not going to just cram a lens in somebody's face. I, I, I just, I don't like that. I don't think that's right for me. Mm -hmm. Others can do what they want to do, but that's not how I'm going to do it. And so when I get out on the scene and I've got, you know, destruction here or whatever the situation and there's people there, I'm going to first off leave my cameras in the car and I'm going to get out and just go walk up and talk to them. Um, I want to assess the situation, assess how they are uh, genuinely. And, I'm, and that's assuming that's at that point in time. In some cases, I'm in a search and rescue mode. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, there was a situation uh, in the wind, Arkansas tornado, where unfortunately I'm having to go and check the pulse of someone who's passed away to let mm -hmm. the family know that she's no longer with us. Yeah. Uh, that's not a camera situation, you know. Yeah. And at that point in time, my role, you know, I'm hugging, I'm, I'm praying with them, I'm trying to help them in a difficult situation. And so that's where I'm doing. But then in many cases, it's not that. And so I, I'm going to do an interview because, I, you know, as I tell them, I don't want to sensationalize what you've been through. Mm -hmm. But I want to be able to tell your story because it may help somebody else. It may be, what did you learn from what you've just been through in the last 30 minutes? What would you do differently now? You know, I usually already know the answer to that. And the answer is going to be, well, I would have paid attention to the warning. Um, but I feel like us talking heads trying to say that is different than somebody who's just experienced it. So if I can do that, and in many cases a little tighter shot helps show that emotion, it, it, that's traumatic for people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gut-wrenching. Um, you know, sometimes, and I've talked to some of our, our guys, and you know, that well, you've got, they've got insurance, and it's just stuff it can be replaced. But Tyler, about five years ago here, a lightning struck just outside of my house, it caused our house to catch fire and we lost everything. Hmm. Myself and my wife stood out in front of the house on multiple occasions, just hugging each other, crying. Yeah, it's just stuff and we're okay. But it was our stuff. It was our memories. Right. You know, it's, it's the Bible that my sister gave to me when I was nine years old and she's passed away that I'm having to throw in a dumpster. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's real. And so in some cases when I'm out there with all the great camera equipment, I'm literally setting the camera down and it's about the people. And it may be a hug. At times I'll be sitting there crying with them, mm -hmm. uh, maybe praying with them. I'll always ask permission for that, mm -hmm. you know, because people have different views of that and I don't want to impose anything on sure. them. But, uh, you know, if I can find ways in that situation to help them in a difficult way and then what it trans transitions to is from the camera perspective can I help them tell their story so that our viewers can know what people are going through um, you know in some cases 
I work directly with some of the national aid organizations. They will literally, they have my cell phone number, they're texting me in the middle of a disaster going, mm -hmm. yeah, Charles, what are you seeing? Do we need to respond to this? You know, Samaritan's Purse uh, with Franklin Graham, um, Mercy Chefs, there's different ones in there literally, and they can, I mean, immediately be responding to that because they trust what I'm seeing, what I know. and. Uh, and then sometimes I'll actually go back in Rolling Fork. My wife went back and worked with uh, Samaritan's Purse for a week, and I was able to work with them for four days just to go back to, to some of the victims and help clean up their houses and muck out and, and stuff like that. But it, if, if I can use that platform to let our viewers, I, I, you know, I realize in this country right now, you know, we're deeply divided, and politics is playing such a big role in all those different things. But, you know, I, I really believe, uh, you know, I'm a military veteran, you know, uh, uh, and know a lot of veterans that have paid uh, dear prices uh, for the freedoms that we have. And with that, I believe we're a great country. And ultimately, we care about one another. And if I can help tell those stories, then I feel like people will be able to give to these organizations of their choosing. They may be able to volunteer their time and to be able to come because one of the things I see in these disasters after a tornado or a hurricane, we see some of the best in mankind. I mean, we see it, we, we cross over racial walls, we cross over political walls, it doesn't matter. We're just humans mm -hmm. and we want to help one another and I see that all the time. Unfortunately, sometimes you see some of the worst in humanity. We oh, get sure. looters out there, different things like that as well. But overall, it's it's the good stuff that I see. Well, and these are our neighbors, whether they're a county away, a state away, several states away. Sometimes where, where you're going, um, you know, these are still your neighbors. You, these are still whether they're strangers, you still care about them. Right, and and, and you know, I think we're. Uh, more mobile society and so if 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 i haven't lived there i probably have family or friends that live there i mean it it, it makes the world a whole lot smaller mm -hmm. uh, with everything especially with social media and it's it's out there immediately uh, and you're right and, and i think it, that helps people to be able to know how can i help so it seems like a lot of the work you do is you're shooting and then you're beaming that out to uh, Atlanta or you know some other producer out there so it seems like you're not really touching the footage too much after you uh, after you acquire it how much does post-processing enter into your workflow well almost everything I shoot I shoot in 4k um, but because it's being sent in over cellular data now if it's coming from my dash camera or occasionally if I've set the drone up then that goes through the broadcast unit they've got a recording of it but sometimes even that going over airways it's not as clean and so I will go back in there and record but I may have you know for an example one of the tornadoes uh, last Friday mm -hmm. you know, I had 20 minutes of tornado footage it's it was on the ground for almost 45 minutes you know well we're not going to show 20 minutes of a tornado that, that's just not TV you know it's going to get cut down to maybe 20 or 30 seconds so what I do then is, is depending on the time frame sometimes it's in the evening because it'll show the next day then I'm going to sit there and I'm going to go through it and I'll put it in there and I'll crap just multiple, maybe 15, 20 second clips, give them maybe two to three minutes worth of video of that situation. And then I'm down sampling that to 1080 mm. because it's going to go up through Wi-Fi or, or whatever. And that's what we're, we're airing it in is in 1080. And so I can uh, do that. I like to shoot in 4K because a 4K down sample to 1080 is better quality than mm -hmm. shooting straight as 1080. Right. But then the other thing that I will do about once a month is I take all that 4K footage, it goes on a hard drive and then that's mailed to Atlanta. And so then for some of our long show programming, different things like that, that gives them the raw footage. Um, their editors are much more talented than I am. <laughs> and so they can do what they want to with it for different shows. But, uh, you know, that's the way it works on the video side of things. Uh, you know, uh, it may be, you know, here's 20 seconds of drone footage and here's, you know, uh, 20 seconds of a dash camera and here's 30 seconds where I got out with B-roll. Um, you know, I'll take still photos too, and, and it's amazing how many great images I still have on a hard drive that I've never done anything with. <laughs> but you right. know, but occasionally I, it'll just be a quick edit um, to throw out there on social media, and uh, 
And if I think I'm going to put it on my website at charlespeakphotography.com for people to buy some of the images, then I'll try to spend a little more time just to, you know, try to have that sharp. I want it the quality. If they're going to purchase a, a print from me, I want it to be a good quality. But, you know, compared to most photographers, uh, uh, very little um, post-processing is done, though, you know, uh, in some of them, if it's a storm, I may increase the contrast a little because if, if that tornado's somewhat in rain and doesn't have good contrast, you can't hardly even see it. Um, and then one of the things I find, you know, uh, it's not always my preference, but if I'm going to put it out there for sale, it's more what I think the, the people who might purchase it. And honestly, they like a little more saturated image than, right. than what I'm trying to do journalistically. And so, you know, when I'm editing my footage for TV, I'm doing the best I can to make that as realistic mm -hmm. as I possibly can. On my photography, when I'm doing that, I'm honestly editing to how I think I like it. You know, uh, I'm a big believer on that. I had somebody make a comment on a picture the other day. I don't think there's a right or wrong way. You know, uh, it's just subjective to the person who did it. And, and I joke with somebody, you can't have an oversaturated image. Well, what do you mean? You, you know, well, if that person wanted it that saturated, they must have liked it that way. Right. So that's fine for them. You know, because we don't like it doesn't mean I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes when I go back to, to see in, in a museum some of the the greats, I see them breaking a lot of the rules. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, and so who decided there's this rule on how it has to be done? And so it's different to me for journalistic. You know, I want to be make that as realistic as I possibly can. But if I'm doing just a piece that, lack of a better word, art, that mm -hmm. is a photograph, then I'm going to edit it the way that I feel like it looks good. And I may turn around six months later and, and change it, you mm -hmm. know, go, hey, wait a second, that's too blue or whatever, you know. Uh, lightning is a good example. There's all different kinds of colors when that flash of lightning, there's magentas, there's purples, there's blues, you know. Well, what's the, how do you want to make that look? They're all there. Mm -hmm. And so it's to taste of which route you're going to go, you know. it's a, There's no way in that fraction of a second a camera's auto white balance is going to get that perfect. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now I remember I guess something more recent, some shots more recent that you, you shot. I know uh, uh, the tornado in uh, Pecos County or uh, um, uh, the one in Fort Stockton, mm -hmm. and that was more recent. We happened to be in the, in the same city, uh, yeah. you know, around that time. Which had was, breakfast the same place that morning. Breakfast the <laughs> same exact cafe, which was just really funny. And then, of course, later that day, I saw uh, footage with your name on it on TV. Like just hours later, yeah. uh, you had gone, you know, you'd driven south and uh, to you know catch up with that weather event. And uh, it did startle me a little bit. I'm like, hey, why are you here? You know, yeah. <laughs> do I need to be worried about something? It is funny, uh, you know, as I travel around, especially if I'm wearing the Weather Channel logo and everything and my shirt and hat and whatever, uh, people, you know, think that, oh, okay, why are you here? You know, it is sort of funny sometimes. It's like, we really don't want to see you, but can I get my picture with you? You know, <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, but, um, you know, it is, it is interesting in that case, you know, uh, uh, Fortunately, on both of those tornadoes, uh, they were in an area that, uh, you know, was basically open fields. Okay. And that's, for me, you know, you can see the beauty in it. Uh, it was interesting. On one of those tornadoes I posted on social media, I said a beautiful tornado out in an open field, not hurting anybody or anything. And there was a couple of comments that said, well, isn't beautiful in tornado an oxymoron? And I said, well, for some it could be. But when they're out there like that, I can see the beauty in them. Uh, I'm careful to not use that terminology if it's one that's destructive or hurt people or hurt things because I realize that's real for that person. And, you know, th their house got destroyed or their family member got killed and, and there's that, that's not beautiful. Right. Um, and so I, I try to be sensitive in that. But in this particular case, out there in a, a farm, somebody made the comment, said, well, the, the farmers, well, in that part of Texas, as you know, there's no crops out there either, <laughs> you right. know. It's maybe they tore up a few tumbleweeds, but you know, other than that, uh, and so you, you could see the beauty in it um, as well. 
Well, and I was even thinking of the responsibility of this type of work. Um, yes, you have the meteorologists that are that are deep in the science, and then and not saying you're not in the science, but it's it's definitely more. Uh, I would say more news gathering, more showing the image, more showing the the inherent danger, uh, the imminent danger that is there. I remember uh, seeing uh, your footage of the tornado in Little Rock. Uh, what was that? Two or three months ago, and I remember seeing the drone footage. I remember seeing your name attached to it, and and I was thinking, oh, he's actually there, you know, because we were. Uh, uh, I remember uh, the vice president of, of Bedford and I we were we were there, you know, or in that region not too long before that, and uh, and of course that was pretty much down the street from uh, our our Little Rock Bedford location. But it was a little eerie to see some of the other cell phone footage, but then seeing your drone footage seeing that that uh that elevated perspective could you speak more about the responsibility that this job entails sure well one of the things with that when i came in there was just off of the interstate and was able to pull into a park and immediately i you know was already looking at it on radar i could see the storm so i didn't have time to set it up to be live with the drone but i wanted to get the, the drone up because you got a lot of trees there and so i was able to get that up and catch that tornado as it was coming from little rock into north little rock in north little rock unfortunately someone was killed by that mm -hmm. tornado and so you know, I got a little of the drone footage, but then I immediately moved to the dash camera because then now that's live. We're back in there and we have found, and it makes sense, that when they see there's really a tornado there, they take the warnings more seriously. Um, you know, we hear all the time, well, you know, we get the warnings and nothing happens. But if they can, if I can get that tornado live on TV, um, then that changes the perspective. It really is happening here. And so that's one of those things that uh, if, if I can capture that and do that, help people understand, okay, this is where it's at, this is where it's going if I'm live on air with it. Um, so it just depends on the situation. But, you know, one of the things, there is a lot of science to it. There is a lot of meteorology to it. But, you know, everything we do is about people. Um, in the uh, deadly Kentucky, uh, it actually started back in uh, the Mayfield, Kentucky, and then went on into Dawson Springs, Bowling mm -hmm. Green. But it started in Arkansas. I was on that tornado south of Jonesboro mm -hmm. when it formed. And we had it there, and then it came up, and it hit Monette, Arkansas. Um, I was at the nursing home there uh, at one point in time, even helping people out of the nursing home. Uh, one was killed there. Mm -hmm. It went on over into, and I can't think of the name of the town, it hit a Dollar General in, uh, there and killed the store manager there. All of that was in Arkansas, and it continued on. Now, it, that storm was moving about 50 miles an hour, mm -hmm. um, so I was able to stay with it the whole time, but then I drove all night, saw that it hit Mayfield, Kentucky got there and was live first thing in the morning uh, that morning. Um, I spent eight days in that area, on Bowling Green, Dawson Springs. And uh, as I told my wife after there, before I came home, I said, honey, I've, I think I've cried more, prayed more and hugged more this week than I have in a long time. Because uh, in many cases, when that, that person's lost a family member, uh, lost their house, this was two weeks before Christmas. It's never a good time to happen, but especially two weeks before Christmas. Um, it, it was just, it, it was gut-wrenching. But one of the days I ended up over in Bowling Green, and uh, the uh, meteorologist in charge of the Bowling Green National Weather Service was out doing surveys, and he was having um, Western Kentucky University as a meteorology program, and some of their students there with him to go with him to help as much as anything experience for them. That's mm -hmm. a unique opportunity. And uh, at one point in time, I had the privilege to talk to the students and, and try to remind them, going, listen, guys, I know we're out here for the science of it. You know, you're trying to do the, the assessment of trying to figure out how strong was this tornado and all that kind of stuff. But I said, as you're walking around, if you get a chance to talk to any of the people, some of the victims that have been through it, take that opportunity because Ultimately, everything we do, all the warnings we put out there, everything we do is about the people. It wasn't probably 30 minutes later, we came to a house that was pretty much completely destroyed and talking to the people that were there. And the man was in the house as it was being destroyed. And as he was telling his story, he got very emotional and started crying. And, 
and the meteorologist in charge, John Gordon there, he walked over and gave the man a hug. I thought, what a great opportunity for these students to see the humanity. These are our scientists. These are the government people who are putting out the warnings. But John hadn't lost sight of the people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, and that's, I think that's what drives me is, is you know, can I, can I use my platform to help them? Um, can I help them understand what the people are going through? Um, because again, I think our people will respond, our country will respond in giving and volunteering and helping them because one of the things we see in these situations, there may be a, a two or three, sometimes just a one day news cycle to it, mm. maybe two or three days, but rarely beyond that. Right. But literally months later and sometimes even years later, it's still not over for those people. Hurricane Laura and that devastated Lake Charles a couple of years ago. There's still blue tarps on some of the homes down mm. there. You know, uh, it's it's still there. I was talking to a pastor in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, that I got to know through the um, after the Rolling Fork uh, uh, tornado back in March, and uh, I talked to, text him about a week ago and said, "How's it going, Brett?" And he said, "It's still really tough." Um, that was especially hard for them. His wife literally had a stroke, and, and we're talking, they have a teenage daughter, so he's not an old gentleman. His wife had two strokes there in the hospital. She had been in ICU, just got moved out of ICU, and was in the hospital watching this tornado. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and his heart was just, I mean, there was some damage to the, the steeple was knocked off the church, but overall it was okay. But I mean, we're talking a block from major devastation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you just have that time and time again, you know, uh, um, in that one, another town a little over, I didn't get to Rolling Fork as it was happening. I was in Silver Springs and, uh, you know, some of the things you see, I mean, I've got a gentleman that's literally was in a trailer home and he's covered in debris. What had happened that night, mutual aid, because Rolling Fork got hit first, the ambulances and fire trucks had gone to, to Rolling Fork. So it took 45 minutes to get mm -hmm. first responders there. And so, I mean, he's under this debris. You could just see his head, he was alive, but you didn't want to take the chance of trying to move him at that point in time because mm -hmm. he wasn't in more imminent danger and wait until the first responders and, and and you know, there were situations where we were having to help carry people out. In some cases, they had, they were deceased. And uh, and just to be able to try to hug a family member that's just distraught mm -hmm. because of what's gone on. And it's in those situations, it's just so raw. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've still got the smell of gas, you know, propane. I mean, just everything is just all around you and just the rawness of it. and. Um, so that just really drives for me, how can we tell these stories? Mm -hmm. And really I, what I strive to do in most cases is rather than me telling the story for them, can I video them telling their story? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's where I work at, um, again, not to just overkill the Sony A7S III, but in those situations, it's dark, you know, you're you don't have the lighting that you need, mm -hmm. but that camera can get those interviews, get that footage that we can be able to tell those stories and uh, in ways that we could never do before. Mm -hmm. So obviously with this storm tracking comes a lot of destruction, uh, but tell me about some of the beauty you see around the country as you travel. You know, it's, it's Tyler, it's interesting because, you know, I'll do 75, 85,000 miles a year driving. Uh, all over the country. Uh, Arizona, Montana is about as far west. I don't usually go more west than that. But, you know, there is a lot of beauty. And one of the things for me a lot of times will be to just stop. I need to get out of the car for a little bit and capture some of the beauty. And so some of the different things that have uh, come in. And one of our meteorologists came up and says, man, we need to sort of showcase this or something. And so uh, the Weather Channel started a new TV streaming app. You can go to streamtwc.com to find out how you can watch that on your TV and your smart TV and, and such, or Roku. 
but one of the episodes we're going to be, or excuse me, one of the programs we're going to be running is sort of a short form. They're going to be five to ten minutes long. Mm. Um, and it's sort of almost like a travel vlog of where I'm going around and showing some of the beauty, some of the interesting aspects. Uh, this is supposed to roll out here in a couple of weeks, and we're going to keep doing aspects of it. Um, you know, one of them was uh, as in a blizzard in Boston, and a friend of mine that I've gotten to know over the years as a, a, a photographer and a, a cameraman that used to cover the Buffalo Bills for mm. forever that's out of Rochester, and he loves to go out to these frozen waterfalls and stuff. And so I called him up. I had a half a day, and I said, what are you doing in the morning? He goes, well, tell me where to pick, pick you up. And we went, and he was able to get access for us because one of these is in a state park where drones are restricted, but he was able to get permission for us to do it. And we were able to get drone footage of these frozen waterfalls, these huge waterfalls, and, and they were just gorgeous. And so we're going to do a little of that. Um, uh, Bridges of Madison County up mm -hmm. in Iowa, you know, just to capture some of that little small town. I mean, you almost feel like you're you're thrown back in the 1800s when you're <laughs> oh, going yeah. through some of that. Um, I did a, a hot air balloons. I get to go out to Albuquerque and do the International Balloon Fiesta every year. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I do a few local ones. One of them was over in Muskogee. And so we did that. And that's going to be one of the episodes. And then recently shot footage of uh, uh, Route 66 in multiple cities in Oklahoma. And so I'm really excited about that, to, to be able to show uh, some of the interesting parts, some of the beauty. And as you know, even though it's video based, you're almost taking some of that photography aspect of capturing beauty and bringing it in there. And so I'm really excited about uh, how this is gonna come about and, and some of the other things. I had one of the producers for that show sending me something yesterday. We need to get you out in, uh, to Oregon and show some of the, he was showing some different things there. And uh, so there's no shortage of beauty in this great country that we live in. That's really neat. I'm looking forward to that series. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, it, it gives a different aspect to it. And so for me, that's interesting, you know, uh, uh, you know, for me, I love doing all different kinds of things. Even here, some locally, um, you know, I'll be down at the Shiloh Museum. I've mm -hmm. done some uh, stories there on the monarch butterflies, and uh, and I had one of our producers one time call me and say, "Do you by chance have any footage of dragonflies?" And I'm going, "No, but I will this afternoon." And so right. we, you know, <laughs> so we went and did that. So I sort of enjoy that as that challenge of getting all different kinds of nature. Uh, at the Weather Channel, we talk a lot about uh, uh, one of the hashtags we use is get into the out there. Mm -hmm. And so that aspect of just getting out in nature and in enjoying some of it. Um, I got home from, I think it was 10 days on the road, and we had had a recent rainfall here. And I called my wife and I said, okay, I'm going to be home about one. Can we go out and do some waterfalls? And so just to go out into the nature where you don't even have cell phone coverage, mm -hmm. you're going to do about a mile hike and, and get to a beautiful waterfall, it doesn't get much better than that. Mm -hmm. Something serene, something so yeah. peaceful about that. Yeah, and everything. So it's, it, it's uh, we're going to see how all this comes together, you know, and, but it, I'm excited about it and, uh, you know, always trying new things. Mm -hmm. Now, what is some advice you would give to either your younger self or somebody in high school or college wanting to get into this type of work? Well, one of the things is to keep in mind, there's very few that are storm chasers that make a full-time living. Uh, uh, social media with YouTube and stuff has is, is given a few more people that opportunity where they can build a following and, and do it that way. But for 99% for of people, it's a hobby. Um, they enjoy it. Now they may get some sales. The Weather Channel will buy it from freelancers here and there, but for the most part, your expenses exceed your, it's about like everything else with what we do. But, uh, but don't let that be your hindrance. I, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm living the dream job. I get paid, uh, you know, to, to travel the country and, and uh, cover weather and cover beautiful things. And, and who would have thought that? You know, 10 years ago, I mean, I, I made the comment to my wife one time uh, when I first started. I've been going in my sixth year with, full time with the Weather Channel. I asked her, we've been married over 40 years. I said, what channel's been on our TV the most? And she, without hesitation, well, the Weather Channel. And people like Jim Cantori and Stephanie Abrams, you know, which are household names and watched all these years. And, and now they're my friends, you mm -hmm. know, and, and text back and forth and different things like that. And so it's, uh, you know, I feel like I'm living the dream and, and love what I'm doing. Um, but the key thing with it, if you want to do it, is remember there is danger involved. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, we've had several storm chasers this year uh, who've gotten themselves in very bad situations and had uh, the tornado literally throw in their vehicle, in one case over 100 yards into a field oh, uh, with minor injuries, fortunately. Uh, but uh, the, the cars totaled different things like that. So, you know, if you get yourself, if you don't know what you're doing, even if you know what you're doing, you can get yourself in a dangerous situation. But if you don't know what you're doing, that the odds of that increase dramatically. So we encourage you to try to find somebody that's experienced that you can go out with. Unfortunately, with my role with the Weather Channel, I can't be me. Uh, but there are people out there, there's tours that you can go on and learn a little about that so that you know what you're doing. The other thing, a lot of times it happens a lot and people love to photograph it, is lightning. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, it's very dangerous. Uh, I know a friend of mine uh, that uh, was out storm chasing on top of a hill and got struck by lightning. He's still disabled with his hearing from that. Mm -hmm. So, and some get killed by it. And so, you know, be smart with it. There's tools that uh, you can get through Bedford's. There's window mount uh, tripod heads, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I think they're like 50 bucks. They're not expensive. And you can put your camera on your window and stay in your car and still position your car and, and get that. Or you can get a remote trigger to put it on a tripod, get back in your car mm -hmm. and do it that way. So, you know, think of the safety aspects of it. But the most important thing that I like to say when I'm talking about photographing weather, whatever camera you have. Mm. The key thing is to go out and make memories, mm. you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, capture it, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, there, there's different ways to learn, and i tell you, YouTube is just incredible with, you know, learning a new way to, to do this, you know. One of the things is something simple that I sometimes forget, you know, you set your, your camera on your tripod for lightning, and if you have image stabilization on, all of a sudden it may try to stabilize something that's already stabilized, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden it's not, not tack sharp. So you gotta, okay, turn that off, you know? Uh, and then people ask me all the time, well, okay, what settings should I use? It's different every time. It depends on the, what the lighting situation, how far is the lighting from you, how far is the lightning from you too, you know, when you're trying to adjust those. So every situation is a little different. But you know how you get figure that out? You go out there more, more and more times. Um, I started out with the Pentax K1000 in mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. So you had to mail that off. And then a few, sometimes weeks later, after you took the picture, you actually, oh wow, that wasn't right. With digital now, you immediately know. Exactly. So go out and have fun. You take lots of pictures and, and learn from them. And if it's all trash, you throw it away and do it again. Yeah. Well, you don't have to throw it away. You just hit a button. Exactly. <laughs> I had to throw away pictures. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it is fun. You know, uh, you know, people like myself, happy to help somebody. You know, I stay really busy and sometimes so if... You know, if you message me and I don't immediately get back to you, it's not because I'm ignoring you, um, you know, but, um, you know, uh, with today's aspect of social media, if you're scantily clad in your profile picture, I'm probably going to ignore it, you know, because <laughs> yeah, right. we're getting so much of that nowadays and stuff. But, uh, you know, I'll be glad to help. There's others that would be glad to do it as well. And, and um, you know, and it's a learning process. I'm still learning, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there's things I'm constantly going Okay, I just added a 360 to my uh, uh, mountain on the top of my roof. And oh yeah. There's all aspects of that. I'm mean, you know just to edit it. You're going okay. How do you do it? You know, and uh, so it's a whole learning process too. But it, it's amazing with the technology that we see evolving and is coming all the time. I mean, I'm gonna give you an example. Literally, I, you know, because this travel vlog. Mm -hmm. Well, you just had something on YouTube about. Uh, a vlog set up there mm -hmm. and I'm going, hmm, I might need to get that, you know, right. and stuff. So it's always like, uh, you know, the only problem I run into is I use an expedition. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the extra long version and it's full. Um, one of the challenges my wife in, in May will usually take what she calls her chasecation. So she'll take a week of vacation. We try to, uh, like with Memorial Day, so it's 10 days and she's gonna go out there. But then I've gotta figure out how to make room for her in the vehicle, because I've got all this equipment. Uh, I try to duplicate many things in case something doesn't work. You know, I carry three drones and a couple of computers and multiple cameras and extra tripods and 
you know, about extra everything that I mm -hmm. can think of, you know, uh, extra cables, there's a lot of different cables that you need and uh, and work from that perspective. But then it's like, okay, when you, you know, she's going with me, I've got to, okay, I got to make room for an extra suitcase and for her to be able to sit in the front there. Right. You know? So, but uh, it's always uh, great fun when I have her out there with me and because this for her, the amazement, I, I remember, um, somewhat her trepidation to the first time I had her near a tornado. And uh, and then the last time, you know, I mean, she's sitting there pointing them out. You mm -hmm. know, hey, there's one over here, you know, <laughs> and stuff. And so that's always fun to see. So what is a non-camera, non-lens physical item that you always keep with you at all times on every shoot? Well, in my case, because of what I do, it's actually what I put all that stuff in. And it's my vehicle. Uh, for me, uh, you know, my vehicle is the workhorse of one that gets me where I'm needing to go. But I've got built into there a 2,000 watt inverter because you need power for all these different things, a dash camera, a broadcast unit, you're needing to power up, uh, uh, recharge batteries, you know, just all these different things going all the time. So that's in invaluable. And then I've got lights on top of it. Uh, because in many cases, you know, you can imagine if we could only video during the day at nighttime and then you get street lights are out, powered mm -hmm. down. This gives me the ability to light things up and gives us more opportunities for video after dark. And so that's important for me. Plus the ability, I've got a built-in um, truck rack that actually rolls out in the mm -hmm. back to be able to, and then it's I've built a shelf on it. And so it carries all this equipment and uh, gives me all that ability to do that. And so for me, that's, I mean, I've got, um, it's four wheel drive. I've got these uh, gnarly uh, all terrain tires. So, you know, when I get in uh, sometimes snow, um, I literally this year uh, was in Buffalo with 81 inches of snow. <laughs> it was, uh, Cantori was up there with it. We were having a blast. I had one of my videos go viral. Um, it was a situation where I videoed some of the uh, Buffalo Bill Stadium. Oh, yeah. And they had to move the game. And so that went viral out there. Uh, uh, the uh, Buffalo Bills Mafia, I think, is what they call it, or something like that. The fans and stuff. Oh yeah. You know, uh, you know, uh, interstates were closed, roads were closed. Uh, it forced trucks to be on side roads. You couldn't get around. You know, uh, I carry a tow strap and trying to help pull some people out and things like that. But with um, that vehicle, I carry a shovel too because you can still get high center when you get that much snow. Um, but you can sometimes get on muddy roads as well. Mm. Um, and so that, you know, having those kinds of equipment to be able to, to, to off-road when you need to. Now, the next question is, what is an intangible, something that's always in your mind when you go on a shoot? For me, I'm gonna circle back to what we talked about earlier. It's keeping in mind the people. That, yeah, there's the beauty in the storms at times, there's beauty in the nature. But ultimately, it's how is this weather impacting people? Mm. And fortunately, we have people killed by many of the weather phenomenons that you have. And so I'm always trying to keep that f foremost in my mind. How is this impacting people? Is it after the fact in a way that I can personally help them, um, give them comfort, whatever it may be, or how can I help tell a story that may help our viewers be able to help them? Uh, how can I use an interview there that might impact our viewers in a way that they may do something different that just might possibly save their life down the road? So always trying to everything around that go, how does this impact people? And you may say, well, how in the beautiful nature aspects? You know what? I find a lot of people on my social media will make comments that they may be in a situation where they're homebound or they can't travel and they say you were able to take me there so does that give a little bit of a joy to someone when I can take them on this beautiful scene here show this beauty of some part of the country show this interesting thing and let them see something that they'll never be able to see in their their own life so I still feel like it's a people aspect even in the beauty part of it definitely now I know this type of image gathering this type of news gathering 
is not so much for your own self-promotion. I know, you know, it's, it's easier to do that when you're shooting fashion or shooting product and you're using that for, you know, hopefully promotion for the next job. It seems like this type of media is definitely, you know, probably the least self-serving. But with that in mind, uh, and the, the value that people can get from it, and especially the safety information, uh, what are some good ways that our viewers can follow you? Sure. On all the social media, I have it set up as Charles Peak. That's P-E-E-K, Charles Peak W-X. And so you can find me on all the different um, methods there. One of the things that drives me, like I said, it can be just to show people something that they wouldn't see otherwise. But the other thing is, is there are times when I'm trying to get a warning out that maybe the Weather Channel's off air at that point in time. That happened in the Nashville tornado seven years ago. I could see it there. Well, the more people that follow me on social media, the broader Facebook shows that to other people. And so can that be another way to get warnings out when those times uh, occur? Uh, we'll also use, like we use a tornado um, condition index at the Weather Channel. And so on the bigger days, I'll try to put those on my social media just as another way to make people aware, hey, today's a day you really need to be paying attention to your weather. So hopefully using it as a way to help people. Uh, also, like I said before, it may be showing somebody's story. Here's a way you can help somebody. Here's, you know, those types of things. And then also, um, you know, I, I, one of the things I've found interesting in social media is that um, what I have for lunch, um, it's amazing. Sometimes that's the most popular things I put out there. <laughs> I don't understand it, but I'll show my lunch and, uh, and, and it'll get a thousand different likes, you know, and something really important like a tornado warning, you know, has 20, but that's the Facebook or Twitter or whatever algorithms and how they work and everything. But on a real note, I have found that a lot of the people like to see the humanity in me. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, just the aspects of what I'm doing, how I'm doing, and those types of things. And so when possible, I try to bring that into my social media as well. Well, thank you so much, Charles, for allowing us into an insight into your world and uh, maybe into a career path or some other type of uh, filmmaking or, or photography that somebody may not have thought of before. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to know you as a friend, glad to know you as a, as a person, and I appreciate you sitting down to speak with us. Um, uh, thankfully, people can follow your work. They can, of course, keep up to date on, uh, you know, with the Weather Channel, uh, you know, the, the information that they're, they're putting out there to help a lot of people, especially in a uh, scary time, definitely. Sure. Um, and Tyler, I, I greatly appreciate Bedford's, uh, you know, I mean, you're not paying me to do this. So no, that's no. <laughs> uh, this is personally myself. But over the years, y'all have been a great asset to me, um, be it with trying to figure out a piece of equipment. Um, I've even had one of your associates, Jessica, one time uh, I'd called the manufacturer and they couldn't tell me how to do something. We were doing a, an eclipse and, and you were supposed to be able to do HDMI out of the camera. And she's on top of a thing trying to get a TV and, and y'all go to those extra extremes. You, know, you can't get that from online places. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate what y'all do for me personally and what you do for other customers as well. Well, we really appreciate it. It means a lot to us, and and uh, you know we just want to help as many people as possible, uh, especially those of you that may be interested in some of the gear that we talked about today. Uh, if you have questions about that, or maybe you want to make this part of your kit, uh, visit us either in store or online at bedfords.com. We want to help you out. Uh, we want to get you uh, from A to B. We want to help you get to that point, and uh, whether that's helping people with weather-related events or fashion photography or, or sports. Uh, we just want to help you get there. And uh, thank you again very much for sitting down and, and, and spending some time with us. And as, as well as you, thank you for, for uh, spending some time with us, uh, you know, part of your day. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next episode.